for sticking so rigorously to your allotted time. Can I give you an idiot layman summary of what I think we've heard so far, which I found very fascinating? Um, one of the problems I have with the, um, the other side of the debate, the people who, who, who cleave fervently to the uh, idea that CO2 is the author of all our ills, it seems to be based on what I call an I reckon argument. It's the kind of thing that you're, you're down the pub with your mates and you feel in your bones that something must be true just because of stuff you read in a paper somewhere and it kind of makes sense. And a classic I reckon argument is uh, the idea that we can't be pumping all these millions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere without it having some effect. And I saw some pictures of um, some melting glaciers. And why are they melting? I mean, like, like, isn't that a sign that global warming is happening? We're all doomed. Uh, and what about the polar bears? And I think a lot of this stuff is based on a very partial understanding of, of the complexities of the world. For example, how many people even think about the oceans as a significant um, driver of climate change? We don't think about the oceans. I'll tell you why. Because none of us, unless we're maybe uh, long-distance yachtsmen, most of us don't live on the ocean. We're very sort of land-centric because we are <laughs> land creatures. Who knew, for example, unless they came here, of course, that um, thermohaline circulation takes place over a thousand years? I mean, these are much bigger scales than most of us are used to, to thinking about. And I think if you go to other sessions in this conference, what you may find is that there are scientists, equally eminent, who disagree violently with uh, what these three gentlemen have been telling us. They will tell you that no, it is solar radiation and sunspots and things which drive climate these gentlemen disagree. Uh, what I think we can conclude um, is that this idea that, that CO2 is the main driver of climate change, it's, it's, it's a theory, but it is but one theory among many, and it has become very fashionable through overpromotion, through general public ignorance, that I reckon um, phenomenon that I talked about earlier. Anyway, I'm going to open the, the floor to questions, but first, can I pose to the gentleman of the panel a question of my own, exploiting my privileged position as the moderator? Um, we know that since 1997, there has been no global warming. And one of the, one of the excuses trotted, about, trotted out by the other side is, ah, yes, but the reason for this is um, the heat has disappeared into the oceans. Is that, is that the kind of excuse they've used? Can you explain whether this theory has any validity or whether it was just invented on the hoof in order to, by the other side to justify the fact that there has been no global warming? Invented on the hoof. Do we have these mics? Oh, I guess this one's working. Okay, I think it is, I mean, as much as I hate to break it to you, it is a plausible theory. Um, as we talked about, as Bill Kinemeth and I talked about, if you increase the vertical mixing in the ocean, you cause global cooling at the surface, okay? If at the same time you had CO2 trying to warm the surface, you can have, by chance, no net effect, no warming for the last 17 years. Now you think, well, that's quite a coincidence, right? I agree, that would be quite a coincidence. But theoretically, it's possible, okay? Um, so it's, you know, yeah, it's theoretically possible. So I don't poo-poo that theory, even though, you know, I've had my run-ins with Kevin Trenberth, and he's the lead proponent of this. I have to say, as a scientist, it's theoretically possible uh, that that's what's going on. In this business, it's virtually impossible, if not impossible, to prove anything. Well, I would uh, uh, respectfully disagree that uh, this is possible with the, thir with the MOC and the uh, deep circulation having been stronger 
than normal since 1995. I, I see no way how you could get heat down in the deep ocean when it's uh, actually turning over more and tends to cool the ocean more. I'm taken to the idea to some extent because uh, McFadden and Zhang wrote a, night, a very nice paper in, uh, in, published in Nature in 2002 where they spoke about an analysis of the uh, surface Pacific waters where they explained the warming that they saw had taken place over the previous 20 years as a reduction in upwelling. In other words, the, the, uh, there was uh, less heat going, sorry, there's more heat going into the ocean at that time. Uh, on the other hand though, if all this heat is going into the ocean, well that's great because the stratification of the ocean is warm at the top and cold down below. So if it's going downwards, it's not going to come back up again unless you defy the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, it may be an explanation, uh, but if it's, that's the explanation, what they're doing is they're saying that uh, the oceans are important. And uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that the first computer models represented the oceans as a very thin swamp, and so they had no circulations at all. And they had the same response as what the current computer models with all their bells and whistles have got. So they're saying that on one side, that the oceans are important, and on the other side, they're saying, well, no, oceans are not important. So there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties. Thank you. So even, even if they're right, it doesn't really help their argument, is what we're saying. That's good. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, we have time for a couple questions. I'll try to keep them short so we can get a couple in. Um, I'm sure the speakers will be around. And I'm going to try to limit it to one per person so we can get as many people as possible. Thanks. Isn't Trent Burst's argument uh, basically a bunch of guys arguing over how many angels you can stick on the head of a needle? It really doesn't make a difference for one and for two. How is it that a Dumbo in State College took him apart on April 13th on his Super Nino coming up? It appears the gentleman uh, doesn't really observe the weather. He was observing all this warm water coming up and not understanding that the physical drivers of the entire system were not present. You know, they're backing off on the Super Nino now, of course, which, by the way, is the fifth Super Nino I've heard about, four of them from Hansen, since 1997. So what I'm saying is it seems to me is all he's doing is reworking Bill Gray's idea on the Meridian overturning circulation and putting his own uh, spin on it. True? False? Maybe? I mean, anything's Well, I, th I think that's what Bill Kinemuth was saying, is he, they're, they're admitting that changes in ocean circulation can have an effect on global climate. I mean, for many years they were saying, oh, there's no changes. And none of the climate models would have ever predicted, you know, what we've seen in the last 17 years. None of them did. Um, so they're admitting that, yeah, natural variability does impact global temperatures. Okay, what you need to understand is that the IPCC must protect at all costs high climate sensitivity. All right, there's all kinds of evidence being amassed now that the climate system is not as sensitive as they think it is. So they come up with all these other explanations. All the heat's being stored in the deep ocean and when that natural cooling process ends, then we're all done for, you know, because the heat's going to return with a vengeance. Theoretically, it's possible. But what you got to realize is they're coming up with all these alternative explana explanations because the last thing they can give up is high climate sensitivity, which causes the models to produce a whole bunch of warming into the future. And that's what I think, and Pat Michaels and Dick Lindzen, we all think that is, that's the holy grail of the climate system. And we have strong disagreements with them about how much, how sensitive the climate system is to anything, including adding CO2. Okay, next question back here. 
kind of a comment, and any of you could respond to this. This is what I love about these conferences, Stan Goldenberg, Hurricane uh, Research Division in Miami, is that there is differences in the views from the scientists here. This is what real science is about. There's very few things that every scientist agrees absolutely on every detail, and we go back and forth and back and forth, and I appreciate the disagreements on the panel from three people that are experts and know what they're talking about, but each one knows is more of an expert on each area. So thank you very much for the disagreements. And any of you want to comment on that? <laughs> Just to make a comment that I think we uh, all agree on our, our own limitations of knowledge and that we accept that there is a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, one of the things that um, I'll talk about in the morning is that you only learn through decades of research that typically whatever you come up with for a theory to explain the natural world, chances are you're going to be wrong. And you get humbled over the years because you usually are wrong. So yeah, we're talking about different possibilities. We, we lean in different directions, but nobody really knows what's, what, you know, what's, what's, well, what's going on. I, uh, I would uh, somewhat disagree with that. I would, <laughs> in me, um, you know. Uh, well, I know one thing that I, if you double CO2, if the blockage of IR to space is 3.7 watts per square meter, as everybody says, and yet it, all, we have 342 units coming in and out all the time at the same time, whatever CO2 can do, it can't do that much without the positive feedback, and I don't think that's there. So I think we can say CO2 is not going to warm the globe much. It's just no way, no physically way that it by itself can do what the models and 90% um, uh, of the scientists say. It's not possible. I think that it, that's we can say something there. Can I just make one uh, comment on the, the basic assumption of the uh, carbon dioxide warming theory is, that the, is the assumption of energy balance at the top of the atmosphere. If you don't have energy balance at the top of the atmosphere, the, the hypothesis doesn't hold up. Now, I showed the diagram of the net top of the atmosphere radiation, the annual average, and there's solar excess in the tropics and there's deficit in the poles. The role of the oceans and atmosphere is to transport that excess heat from the tropics to the poles. Now, if it doesn't do it in a, in a way that, uh, that, that uh, is predetermined, we're going to have times of excess uh, heat coming in and times of excess heat going out. It'll fluctuate about that equilibrium. And so I think that's one of the main weaknesses of the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis. Another question back here. Uh, <clears throat> A comment about Kinnaman's uh, speculation about Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, it's all true, of course, that Jupiter and Saturn affect the position of the sun because they go around sometimes on the same side of the sun, sometimes they're on opposite sides, and so forth. Uh, but the graph that you showed at the same time didn't really quite go with it because it was on the half million year uh, uh, abscissa whereas the uh, periods of Jupiter and Saturn are, what, 11.26 for Jupiter and I think 26 or something for Saturn. So the, the time scales just didn't quite match. Uh, just a point on that. It, it was just a, <clears throat> an illustration that uh, the, and I, I didn't give the time periods of the, the, uh, the sun moving away from the, the center of gravity of the solar system, but just to make the point that those large, uh, uh, planets do have a significant effect on the sun and on the Earth's uh, orbit on different periods. And so it's not just a direct influence, it's this exchange of angular momentum which changes the orbit and the eccentricity and so forth on different time scales. And that's what's going to be influencing the ocean. Not sort of the direct gravitational effect like the moon, but this build up of, uh, of exchange of angular momentum and then the release again in time. Okay, another question. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, I've learned something today. The, um, you all talk about changes in the ocean current, a stronger or weaker, a faster or slower, and a, a greater upwelling. 
So my question is, uh, do you think that it can explain this, the PDO cycle, for example, these changes in the great ocean current? Could that be the, the reason why we've had PDO changes for uh, thousands of years? What do you say, change or what? PDO. 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 Just, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we really understand what changes the PDO, but I spoke about the two uh, scales of, of motion in the ocean. One was the, the ENSO scale, which is interannual, and the other was the very much longer term uh, sort of thermohaline circulation, it's about a thousand years. But there's another sort of circulation, which is the formation of intermediate water, which largely is the interaction of the mid-latitude westerlies and the upwelling associated with the Ekman turning, which is driving cold water under the, the, uh, the warmer uh, tropical waters. And so, the, here we do have the potential for very strong interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean to give feedback that gives oscillations on these sort of timescales. But again, it's, it's all speculation as far as I know. Uh, yeah, I would like to comment. We've been looking a lot at this. Yes, the uh, PDO uh, changes as the uh, thermohalion in the Atlantic. The Atlantic leads away in the PDO seems to lag with uh, eight, nine years uh, following, but they're related. It's all the MOC circulation. When the, um, the PDO tends to go negative following the Atlantic thermohalion being stronger, and when that happens, the MOC, the whole global thing, is a little bit faster and uh, the globe tends to rain more and tends to slightly cool. They're related. They're definitely related. The whole ocean circulation is related. When the Atlantic changes a certain way, the Pacific will, will change too, but with a lag. There's lag. The ocean has these uh, longer period of fluctuations, and um, they're crucial to understand the climate, I believe. Yeah, the results that I showed are consistent with the PDO explanation, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Uh, some people have published the thought that the PDO is a low frequency modulation of El Nino and La Nina. During the positive phase of El Nino, you get stronger I mean, during the positive phase of the PDO, you get stronger El Ninos, which leads to warming. During the negative phase of PDO, you have stronger La Ninas, which leads to cooling. And that's basically what we showed. So yeah, the PDO is involved uh, to the extent that, and, and, and I agree, yeah. we really don't understand what causes PDO. You know, the, the observational record only has a couple of complete cycles, which is 60 years. So it could be that the PDO goes away next century because it was just one of many natural modes of climate variability that doesn't last forever. Who knows? We don't know. Well, uh, well except Bill. Uh, no, no, I, I, <laughs> no, I, I agree very much I, w with what Roy just said, but uh, don't, we know something, Roy. We, you sound as if we don't know. We know a few things along the I, way. Uh, this is the subject of my talk tomorrow morning. What do we know about climate change? And I'll give you a heads up, virtually nothing. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Perhaps humble on asking the last question. I prefer wrestling with the IRS than the climate change <laughs> scientists. Uh, so my hat's off to you guys for the bigger battle. Um, I almost failed thermodynamics in college. It, it was almost my undoing. My little bit of understanding, El Nino, La Nina, has to do more with what I think is underseas volcanic activity and the upswell of the heat from the volcanoes along the tectonic plates, that if you run the formula of heat transfer, the atmosphere cannot heat the ocean very deep, cannot impact that greatly, but the volcanic activity under the oceans has the opportunity and chance to transfer that jewel heat to change the up well as I'm learning new terms. Is there a comment? I think the question is... Well, from what I hear from geophysicists, activity. the average heat flow, geothermal heat flow on a global basis is less than 0.1 watt per square meter. It's really tiny. So, you know, even if you talk about variations in geothermal heat flux from, let's say, volcanoes at the bottom of the ocean that change it by a factor of two or three, 
you're still talking about a really small heat flux. So I haven't seen any evidence that suggests that changes in geothermal heating can have much of an impact, but maybe we don't know that much about what happens at the bottom of the ocean. Just to comment on the other scale, the, uh, the uh, tectonic plate movements, uh, I certainly am, am happy with the view that over these very long time periods, and we're talking about millions and, and millions of years, certainly that's having a, has had a bigger impact on climate. And in fact, it's the, the opening up of the Southern Ocean has had the most dramatic uh, impact, I think, over the last 100, years, 100 million years that uh, allowed this upwelling and overturning to take place. Um, my Lord Monckton is gagging to ask a question, and I'm sure it'll be very entertaining. So let's, let's give him the floor. What does the panel think of the remark by Gerard Rowe in his paper of 2009 on feedbacks that the Pacific decadal oscillation is neither decadal nor an oscillation, though it is in the Pacific? Sorry, I, I, you have to repeat it, Lord Monckton, because um, uh, <laughs> the panel didn't hear. Um, if I use it, don't use that, you'll hear better, I expect. Okay. <laughs> we, we're talking about semantics and what is a, uh, an instability versus an oscillation versus uh, various other feedbacks and so forth. Um, there is variation takes place, whether you want to define it as, as an oscillation or a, an instability or whatever. There is change taking place and it is in the Pacific. So um, thank you very much for coming. Hands up. Who came here not thinking the ocean was that important, but is now convinced that the ocean really is important? <laughs> well, some of us have had our minds changed. Um, thank you to the panel. Thank you very much. We've changed three minds. <laughs> <laughs>